My former boss, Persico Jr., he represented himself in the mob commission case. And you know what they say, you know, any attorney that represents himself has a fool for a client. End result, conviction, 100-year prison sentence. Hope everybody is doing well. Hope you enjoyed Mob Movie Monday. Uh, got a lot of good comments from uh, the movie Bugsy. If you haven't seen it, go back and watch it. It was a good one. And uh, I told you uh, last week when we did the 50 biggest uh, mob bosses, the Fortune Magazine article, that I was going to take, you know, a few of those guys. Uh, there were about 25 on the list that I either knew or had uh, some kind of personal involvement with. And I told you I would take each one of them and kind of do, you know, my perspective, my story on them. And uh, today I'm going to start with uh, Carmine Persico. Now, he was number six on the list, which was obviously wrong. Uh, they had him behind Jerry Langella, Jerry Lang, who is actually his underboss. So, again, referring back to that list, I told you, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it wasn't an accurate list at all. Sold a lot of magazines, but uh, it, it wasn't accurate. People that should have been on the list weren't on the list. People that were on the list, if we were real, were not rated the right way. A whole bunch of things like that. But anyway, it was, a good, it was a good article if you enjoy that kind of stuff. But, you know, talking about Persico, obviously very personal to, uh, to me. He was my boss. Um, and I had a good relationship with him for the most part. And um, the problem with Persico is that even though he was the family boss, my boss, throughout my whole tenure in that life, uh, even from the time I was a recruit, um, I was only with him two years because he was always in and out of prison. So my relationship with him really was from, I think he was released in 78, um, latter part of 78, early 79, something like that. And he went back in in 1981. So it was actually two years, almost three years that he was on the street that I interacted with him. And I liked him. I liked Persico. You know, and people ask me, was he a good boss? You know, I think he would have been a good boss had he been able to stay out, be on the street and, you know, run the family unobstructed from all the things that he had to deal with. Now, obviously, Everybody in that life that has a high profile, especially the bosses at that time, are going to be scrutinized all the time. So he would have had that. But in his case, it was it was even more intensified. Just to go back a little bit, um, I'm not going to go through his history. Look, you can go on Wikipedia and read some stuff about these guys. I'm not going to get into all of that. But uh, he was a powerful guy. You know that his nicknames were the snake. He didn't like it. Uh, I never addressed him that way. Uh, and Junior, and I called him Junior all the time. I didn't call him Pars uh, Persico or uh, uh, Carmine. I called him Junior. And uh, that's what he was known as uh, for all of the guys in, in the family. And, um, you know, his, his, he started having trouble early on in his life, but it was really in 1960 that he was indicted for, I think, a big hijacking case. Went to trial five times over the course of eight years until they finally convicted him in 1968. Unbelievable that the government pursued him five times. Normally, if you don't get a conviction after two or three times, uh, they'll dismiss the case. I know. I had three hung juries in one case, and they finally dismissed it. But uh, in Junior's case, they, they just kept the pressure on. I guess they figured at some point in time they would get a conviction. They did in 1968, and uh, he was sentenced to, um, I think, 12 years in prison. He went in in, uh, I believe, 1971 or 72. He ended up doing about eight years on the 12, which was pretty much the max. And then he got out, and like I said, he was out for that three-year period. And, um, you know, then he's indicted again in 1981 on some kind of bribery charge and he goes back in. And so I met him quite often because I was locked up uh, in 1984, 1985 rather, um, with my indictments. And we were in MDC um, in Manhattan together for several months. And then, uh, you know, we went on our way. You know, he stayed in New York and was on other trials. And I went out uh, after I got designated to prison after I took my plea. So, you know, let me um, 
Again, a little bit more history on him. Uh, he's indicted again in 1981 on a bribery case. He goes back into prison. He comes out, or he was, yeah, he comes out and uh, he gets indicted again on the Colombo trial, they called it, where a lot of the guys were indicted. He was indicted, Hugh McIntosh, you know, his, one of his uh, very close friends, Andrew Russo, Mike Capo at one time, Mike Capo regime, um, and a bunch of guys get indicted. And uh, he goes on the lam. He leaves. You know, he's, he's not hanging around for this because he knew that if he got convicted on this, it was, it was going to get a big number. It, it ends up that he's on the lam for a while and there's a nationwide uh, manhunt for him. He was actually one of the, you know, most wanted on the FBI's fugitive list. And obviously we're following all of this. He's our boss. We had acting bosses during that time, but he's our boss. And uh, he ends up uh, hiding out at his brother-in-law's house, a guy by the name of DeChristopher was his last name. Unbeknownst to Persigo and to any of us at that time, DeChristopher was an FBI informant for a number of years, bought himself out of his own problem that he was having. He's an FBI informant. He immediately lets the FBI know that uh, Junior was hiding out at his house. The manhunt that they staged was actually a phony manhunt, and they did it just to protect their informant to Christopher. Amazing stuff that the FBI will go through. So at the appropriate time, they go in and, uh, you know, they, they make out that they had information and they, uh, they apprehend Persico at Chris, Christopher, to Christopher's house. <clears throat> and then he goes on trial in the Colombo trial, uh, gets convicted and he gets 39 years. Jerry Lang also got convicted, a bunch of guys, and they got heavy time on that. Uh, you know, going back, during the two years that I knew Junior, I got to like him. Look, he wasn't a greedy boss as far as, you know, my experience with him. He was not. He treated me well. Um, you know, he knew what my role in that family would be. He made me a cop regime in 1980. I was acting captain for my father at the time, and he appointed me officially as a cop regime at the same time that he broke my father. And what do I mean broke my father? He took my father's uh, position away and he took it away because he said my father was always getting violated for association. So he didn't want him to expose himself by being in the position of capo regime and having to meet with soldiers and so on and so forth. Quite honestly, I didn't believe that. I didn't buy into it because I was my father's acting capo any time, any, any way. And I was seeing everybody and bringing news back to my father. And my father, in that turn, we would discuss and he would tell me how he wanted me to handle it. So my father wasn't exposed in that regard. Whenever my father got violated, it was for silly stuff that he did. It was mistakes that he made. I got to I gotta say it with these association charges. But I saw that, uh, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, knowing what was going on at that time, I was starting to... Um, you know, really do well in the gas business. I'll get into that a little bit. And I think that Persico wanted to make sure, being that my father was out of prison, that um, we weren't doing anything because we were pretty popular in the family. My father had a lot of prestige and a lot of respect. And, you know, I was really getting my position also pretty well intact. And I think Junior wanted to make sure that we understood that he was the boss, which we did. You know, that's how the life goes. You know, you protect your position, protect your family. And and uh, and Junior was good at that. At least he tried to be good at that. So, um, you know, 1980, you know, I start to uh, move up. And uh, in 79, when Junior came home, that's when I was really starting to understand what I had with the gas business. I approached Junior. I said, Junior, I'm going to show you more money than you ever saw before in your life. But you got to protect what we have here. Let's not let other families get involved in this, because once we do, we're going to blow it. And for those two years that he was out, I had many sit downs with other guys and other families trying to get involved in the business. And Junior supported me 100 percent because I was giving him a lot of money, made a lot of money with me, I have to say that. And so we had a good relationship in that regard. His son, Ali Boy Persico, who was also a cop regime at that time, uh, he's my gumbada. He baptized my oldest boy, John. Uh, unfortunately, you know, my, uh, my son John never really got to know him because Ali Boy had his problems. And as you may or may not know, Ali is doing life in prison right now, too. Very sad story. The whole family was, was uh, you know, really hurt. Uh, the same way mine was by my father's involvement. But anyway, so... Um, now, Junior goes in after that manhunt, they catch him, he goes to trial, he gets convicted on that case, he gets 39 years, and 
almost at the same time that that was going on, what happens? He gets indicted on the mob commission case by Giuliani. And uh, that was another big one. Funny thing there is that Junior decided, okay, I got 39 years. Um, what do I got to lose? I'm going to represent myself. And he became his own lawyer. He represented himself in the commission case. Now, I will tell you, because I was, you know, around when all the scuttlebutt was going on. The other guys on that case were not happy. You know, there was a lot of bosses indicted in that case, you know, Fat Tony and, and Tony Ducks and all these guys. They were not happy about it. They did not want him to represent himself. But he thought that, you know, with his charisma, he could make the jury like him. He was already doing 39 years. Uh, he thought that he could pull it off. So he represented himself. And from what I understood, you know, he handled himself pretty well. He obviously had a lot of experience. However, during the trial, he had to admit to certain crimes that he had committed in the past probably didn't sit well with the jury. Another thing interesting about that trial, you know, that you may not know, and one of these days I think I'll do something on the commission trial, because it was an amazing case. Um, but um, it was the first time, you know, in, in that RICO indictment, obviously if you don't understand what RICO is, you have to be, uh, they have to prove the government that you're part of a criminal enterprise. The lawyers in the case told all the defendants because of these wiretaps that were terrible, because of the informants, because of the bugging devices, especially the one in Sally Avellino's car with Tony Ducks that they had for, they had so much information on there. They said, this information is so incriminating that you as a group have to admit the existence of the mafia. You have to admit it. But our defense is going to be just because you're a a member of the mafia, it doesn't mean that you committed the crimes that you're alleged to have committed. And that's what they had to, to do in the case. They had to defend it like that. So this was the first time in, um, in open court that the defendants on trial admitted that they were part of the mafia. You know, it was a landmark thing that happened there. And uh, Persico representing himself and say, yeah, I'm part of, I'm, I'm the boss of the, of the Colombo family. I had to say it. So a lot of stuff came out at that trial, people. You know, this is why I say more stuff has come out on bugs and wiretaps and informants. You know, I told you about the Gotti case where they had over 2,000 hours of tape recorded conversations with, uh, you know, Ruggiero and Gotti and a whole bunch of guys. So much information came out on all of these things. You know, unfortunately, we didn't keep up with the times. We didn't we didn't know. I mean, you know, I'll be honest with you. I was never really caught on incriminating information on any bugs or wiretaps. I, I attribute that to my father early on, putting it in my head. Michael, you know, be careful. Look at the phone as a cop. He used to tell me, the phone is a cop. He said, be careful what you say. I think I told you at one point in time when we were uh, in our house, you know, my dad, when he wanted to talk to me, he would take me in the bathroom. He would turn the faucets on, flush the toilet. And we would lean our heads into the into the faucet so that when he can tell me something, he'd whisper and no bugging devices could pick it up. That's how careful he was. Later on in his life, he got a little bit careless. Things were said that, you know, unfortunately, informants and my brother, John, who was bugged, they got my dad in some, you know, with some incriminating information. But but he put that in my head early on. And I'll be honest, with you, I still don't like the telephone. I don't like to talk on the phone. Just how I am. It's been ingrained in me. But um, so they go to trial in the commission case. And, uh, you know, there's a saying out there, a lawyer that represents himself uh, has a fool for a client. And uh, even though I understood that the judge even, you know, uh, complimented Persigo uh, and said, you did a great job. You're a smart guy. Too bad you haven't put your resources into the legitimate world. You probably would have done very well, which I agree. He was a smart guy. Um, he ended up getting convicted uh, on all counts, and uh, he got 100 years, like every one of the other guys. And uh, there's only one guy that got 40 years on that case, and that was uh, Bruno. And he's on that list also, Indelicato. He got 40 years. He's out now, 74 years old, living his life, from, from what I understand. But um, that's what happened. Now, you know, while he's in jail, 
in order to maintain, Persigo that is, in order to maintain control of the family, he obviously has to leave an acting boss like he's had to do for so many years. We first had Tom DeBella, then we had his brother Ali, then we had his son Ali Boy. I mean, he had a whole succession of acting bosses to try to maintain control of the family. People that, you know, hopefully could visit him and he can talk to them and communicate and they can run the family business. Very, very difficult, especially with all the pressure that was on the Columbos all the time. So long story short, without getting through it, uh, into it too, too deeply, Vic Arena, who was a cop regime and who had uh, Ali Boy's old crew. I knew Vic very well, knew him since I was a kid. He's older than me. Um, he leaves Vic Arena as his acting boss and gave him a lot of authority. I mean, he even allowed Vic Arena to make people, bring them into a family, which is something you don't normally do. But he gave him a lot of authority. He trusted him. As time goes on, Vic Arena gets disgusted with uh, being told what to do uh, by Persico. So he now has the idea that, you know what? I'm not just a placeholder for his son because when Ali Boy came out, he was supposed to take over and uh, Arena would be the underboss. He said, no, I don't want that. I want to be the boss. Happens, right? And so he starts to put a coup together to try to take over the family. Junior finds out about it. I remember at the time, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into my whole involvement at that time, or non-involvement, I should say, uh, but I was certainly called upon to go back. Family goes to war. Goes to war. And by the way, I know this for a fact, uh, Junior did not like Gotti at all, and Gotti didn't like Junior. I had a run-in with Gotti over the gas business. Guess who his, his accomplice was in the run-in? They tried to take over something that I had, Vic Arena. He and Gotti were close. Gotti was one of the guys that were encouraging Arena to take over the family. And um, so that wasn't going to happen. Uh, Persico finds out about it. He puts an immediate contract on Arena. We go to war. And uh, that's been the, uh, the history of the Colombo family. We're always in one war or the other. As a matter of fact, you know, that war lasted for, you know, four years. Arena gets convicted. He gets, you know, 100 years. I think he got 300 years back to back. He's in jail now for life. Persigo never got out, obviously. He did maintain control of the family, though. It's still the Persigo faction that uh, is in control of the family. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but that's his history. He's in jail. And um, I will tell you this. He was in Lompoc Federal Prison. He was in the, uh, the prison, you know, the, the uh, uh, higher institution. I was in the medium security. He was in the maximum security. When uh, I had written my book, uh, we were there at the same time. And one of the uh, correctional officers told me that he had a copy of my book in the cell. And when he read it, he got so enraged, he started ripping the pages out. He was, you know, he was pretty upset with me for walking away from that life. Yes, I'm told he did put a contract on my life. There was some, you know, I did verify things. I had my rough time. But that doesn't mean that, you know, he didn't like me. You know, Junior liked me and I liked him. But look, when you walk away from that life, there's consequences. I understood it. The same way, you know, when the FBI told me, hey, your father went along with the contract. I know it's my father, but I understood. I broke my oath you know, by walking away, and there is consequences to that. And I accepted those consequences when I took my oath. So I get it. Doesn't mean I didn't like Junior. I had one or two, you know, little things with him, um, you know, during that, during my time. But, you know, like I said, things happen in that life. You got to understand it. When you accept, you know, membership in that life, it goes with certain things. And you realize if you violate, you know, Omerta, you violate your oath that there are consequences. So I did that. I accepted it. You know, the good thing, um, you know, I patched things up with my dad, you know, to a degree. I mean, there was still some feelings there. I'm not going to get into that. It's personal, me and my father. But, um, you know, we, we patched it up and I held no resentment really for Junior. I honestly didn't. Sadly enough, um, he did die in prison uh, March of last year and uh, he was never getting out. He was in his 80s. Uh, but that was kind of it. And, um, you know, I, I got to say this, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about the government and how they go after organized crime guys. You know, normally the way cases are investigated and prosecuted, a crime is committed and then law enforcement goes out, investigates the crime, crime tries to find the perpetrators, solves the, the, the crime, right? In the case of organized crime, Cosa Nostra, Mafia, they're targeting the guys and hoping to find what crime the guys are committing. 
So it's different. The crime hasn't occurred yet as far as they're concerned. They're going after the guy, waiting to see what crime they commit. And then a lot of times there is government overreach. I'm gonna tell you this, people, and I've said it, and I'll take it to my deathbed. My father did a lot of things in his life, no doubt, but the case that he was convicted on and did 50 years in prison for, my father was innocent of, he was framed. I investigated that case, I'll take it to my grave. And what you need to understand this, when somebody's being framed, the government has to be complicit in it, okay? They investigate pretty thoroughly. And there's a lot of times that, you know, witnesses are lied to the, to the government, and as long as they cover their tracks and the government wants the defendant bad enough, they'll go along with it. And they'll even encourage it, and they'll even help the situation a little bit. That's what happened in my dad's case. But I wanna tell you why that's dangerous. Whenever you give the government power to do something, don't think that it's gonna lie in that area alone. It'll expand. The racketeering law is a perfect example. That was made to go after organized crime. That's what it was made for. A guy by the name of William DeBake, he was a, he was a law professor. He created the RICO law specifically to go after organized crime. You know how often they've used that law in civil cases to go after companies and, and, and other things? You give the government power to do something, they will expand it and expand it and expand it. And I'm telling you now, there are a lot of people that are in prison that are innocent. They're there on crimes uh, that were fabricated. Um, a lot of times, you know, the government will overreach. You cannot give them the power to do that, even against the bad guys, because if they do it against the bad guys, they'll do it against anybody that helps their agenda. And it's happening right now. Trust me, it's happening right now. And I can give you, a, I, can, I can do one video on cases where judges were admonished prosecutions and law enforcement for such bad tactics that they used. It's ongoing, it's happening. And that's why we as people have to say, no, you can't do that. You go after criminals with the arsenal of laws that you have and you do it the right way. Because if we allow you to do it the wrong way, who's to say you're not gonna do it against us one day? And it happens all the time. That's why I say all the time, accountability to our government officials is crucial for the freedoms that we have here in our country. You know, I'm gonna say something, and some of you are gonna oppose this, but I said it back then, and I'll say it again now, and then I'm gonna leave you. The O.J. Simpson trial. If I had to take a lie detector test right now, I would tell you that I believe that O.J. Simpson was guilty. No question in my mind. However, I will say this. If the prosecution does not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the standard of proof in our country, then O.J. Simpson should be acquitted. They have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. That's how our system works, and that's a safeguard against all of us. And uh, you apply that to everything else. They have enough tools, enough weapons in their arsenal, trust me, to do it the right way. And if they don't have the evidence, they shouldn't be allowed to manufacture it. I know I got off a little bit on Persigo, but it's relevant because Persigo went through all of these trials. I discussed things with him. And some of the things they did with him, I think, were, were wrong. They were wrong just because he was Persigo. And, you know, their attitude is, hey, if we didn't get you for what you did, we'll get you for something you didn't do. So what? Can't do that, people. You can't allow the government to have that authority. And you mark my words, maybe not in this generation. We're experiencing government overreach right now, and you're going to see it happen more and more and more. You're going to see it happen. Just remember, uh, I'm not a prophet, but I'm prophetic in making this statement. You're going to see what happens. So that's it. And I will say this, you know, I was saddened when Percival passed away because he had a tough life. Regardless of what he did, look, uh, I can't say that he went out there and hurt innocent people. I haven't seen any allegation about that. Yeah, he was involved with unions. Yes, he did damage within the life. You know, you know, the say we only kill each other. Whatever. I'm not saying that's right, but I'm not saying that, you know, I, I have no evidence or no proof that he went outside the spectrum of our life and did damage to anybody else. So... I'm not justifying it. I'm not saying we're right. Look, I did a lot of things in that life, too, that they were wrong, paid the consequences, I admit to that, and I'm not glorifying the life. But what I'm saying, it was a very sad situation. Him, his family, his wife, his other sons, everybody suffered as a result of, of what he did and, uh, and the life that he lived. And that's one of the major reasons why I walked away, experienced it in my own family with my father. So, um, you know, I'll leave you with this. Again, I don't like to badmouth people. Uh, I won't do it with him. You know, I'm saddened that he, he passed away under the conditions that he did uh, while he's in jail. But 
you know, that's the, that's the consequences of doing the wrong thing and being involved in the wrong situations in life. So that's it for today. As always, I want to thank you. Our subscriber list just keeps going up. It's growing weekly. I appreciate the loyalty, the following. I'm glad you like the content. We work hard on bringing you uh, good content, both for your in entertainment and for information. So that's that. Uh, continue, keep going. We'll give you alerts all the time. MichaelFrancis.com, growing, you know, in leaps and bounds. We got over 11,000 people now in the community, all helping one another. Uh, products, your people are buying a lot of products online, you know, books and everything else. So thank you for that. Continue to do that. We got a lot of great things coming up, I promise you. So I'm going to leave you now. And how do I always leave you? Be safe, be healthy. God bless you all. I mean that. And I will see you next time.